Have you ever wondered what it's like to sit in on a magazine editorial meeting? Well, this is your chance. You're listening to Salt Lake Speaks, a monthly podcast where our editors, writers, and staff dig deeper into stories, chat with newsmakers, and talk amongst ourselves about arts, culture, food, music, politics, or whatever else might strike our fancy. After all, we are Utah's biggest fans. Hi, this is Salt Lake Speaks, and I'm Glenn Warchell, managing editor of Salt Lake Magazine. Today, we're discussing the ongoing sexual abuse allegations that are rocking the worlds of entertainment, government, and business. Our guest is Diana Witten, a director and producer who lives in Salt Lake and is the founder of the Utah chapter of Film Fatales. It's a grassroots community of women filmmakers who meet to collaborate and mentor each other. Witten's first feature film, Vessel, which you can see on Netflix, premiered at South by Southwest Film Festival and won the praise of the New York Times, being described as unabashed, dramatic, and provocative. The film follows Dutch doctor Rebecca Gompertz and her attempts to bring reproductive choice to women around the world. It's good to have you, Diana. It's great to be here. Thank you. Um, we've seen a current raft of sexual abuse claims. It seems like there's a new one every day. Uh, Harvey Weinstein, Dustin Hoffman, Louis C.K., Kevin Spacey, and more and more. Um, how is this being seen by activist women like the people in film fatales, particularly as it applies to the entertainment industry? I mean, is this a centuries-old overdue adjustment that's finally happening? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> in a word. I mean, it's such an interesting time. I think I can speak from, I'll speak for myself. I think for, you know, yes, it goes back much further than last November, but I think something happened last November uh, when we basically saw a sexual predator be elected into the White House. And I think, you know, even though there has been some really motivating and inspiring events like the Women's March, I think what happened for me was a lot of the anger that I felt when he won went dormant. It went, <laughs> went to sleep because I couldn't deal with it otherwise. And I think since that time, it's been hibernating and gathering strength. And Weinstein awoke the dragon for a lot of us. And just the sheer monstrosity of the story of Weinstein was enough to sort of tip. It was a tipping point. It, tip, it, made, a, it made for a cultural shift that we're in the midst of right now, which I don't think we figured out how to approach with a lot of nuance yet. But hopefully we'll get there. And the subsequent Me Too campaign has just been validating for so many people to have their stories be corroborated by such a, a collective of women, normalized even, um, to, and, then to, and then to see these stories add up to something that actually has repercussions for these men, uh, mostly men, consequence. Well, part of what you mentioned about the nuances emerging, and I believe um, the head of your national organization, Leah Meyerhoff, mm -hmm. brought up how there's not a vocabulary yet to deal with a lot of this. And this has come in the news recently, and I, I want to go there, is Matt Damon walked into a huge controversy because he advanced the idea that there are levels to these crimes, that there's a big difference between fondling through clothes and out and out rape. And he received a lot of pushback from women who felt that this was an incorrect way to approach the problem. Yeah. Uh, I mean, is there, is, does he have a point? I think one of the things that we're up against is this lack of vocabulary for things like consent. I think consent is something that people are, start, are starting to figure out how to talk about with nuance. I think we saw that, I, saw, I noticed it most recently with um, Sp Morgan Spurlock. Mm -hmm. who was one of the men recently, a, a documentary director, who volunteered a letter that essentially admitted to having uh, raped someone in college. Date rape. Well, date rape is rape. Right, right. But I just mean yeah. for our listeners. Okay. Sp Spurlock said that he had done quite a few uh, anti-woman things, including a situation that he felt be could be construed as date rape. And I think the takeaway, you know, none of us were in that room, but the takeaway is he understood consent to mean something that was different from what the women to understand consent meaning. Uh, and, you know, they had a different understanding of that word and, and how it plays out. So I think that's at the heart of what we're talking about here when it comes to sexual situations. We're also talking about uh, power and power in the workplace, which is another nuanced version of, you know, the conversation. 
And, and that's what, you know, we're seeing so many men in high power positions having, you know, being fired or being forced to resign because they have used positions of power in the workplace to make women, you know, put women in these positions where they don't have power and get what they want and, and subdue women. Um, well, one of the things that I wanted to bring up, this is another recent, I mean, this subject is so rapidly changing with, with the news every day, but Judge Roy Moore ran for Senate in Alabama, which was sort of a landmark kind of thing, and he was supported by the president, despite the fact he had allegations of having pursued underage girls in his past. And it seems like the right, because he only lost by a slim amount, it seems like the conservative right doesn't see this issue as important, and that would include women on the conservative right, see this issue as important as perhaps you do and perhaps other people in the entertainment industry do. Um, do we have a severed country? Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's a very hard mindset for me to access, to be totally honest. It's hard for me to go there and, and get into that mindset. I can compare it a little bit to, you know, I worked for almost a decade with abortion rights activists, and a lot of that time was spent interviewing abortion providers, and the amount of denial in the, in the protesters that spend their weekends outside of these clinics is hard to understand. These are people that will protest these clinics every day for years, and then suddenly someone in their family needs an abortion. And suddenly, you know, they're in the clinic and need the help, and then the week later they're back out, you know, protesting the clinics. And this sort of brainwashing <laughs> to a certain extent, you know, I don't want to well, be dismissive of how people think. Compartmentalizing and yeah. denial. Yeah. It's, it's very human and very sure. horrible. Sure, and maybe it gets you through the day and gets you through, you know, part of your life. A survival tactic even, but, but that can be re-educated. Re well, and you brought this up early, earlier. It seems to be, as Judge Moore was attacked, and as Louis C.K., Spacey, Hoffman have taken their hits, President Trump, who on video did a blueprint for sexual harassment with an imbalance of power, seems to have walked through this unscathed so, so far. <laughs> Does that say something about uh, our nation's ability to deny and counterbalance? I'm no expert, but I, I think what we saw in Hollywood was this critical mass in that sector. Uh, and it was because a group of powerful and privileged women were able to, um, to join together with a certain amount of sorority and a certain amount of power and put this out there and it changed the story in that sector. And I think in terms of the political sector, that hasn't necessarily hit the tipping point yet. I have heard of this list that exists among senators, who uh, a list of senators who have basically bought the silence of women, uh, who accuse them of sexual harassment using U.S. taxpayer money. I don't, I haven't seen that list, but I've heard about it on NPR. I feel like if that comes well, out, we know it, that has happened. it exists, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, we don't, we don't know who's on a list but we know there have been incidents in which uh, elected officials use money to do settlements. It is interesting to me to see, what, it will be interesting to see what happens if that list gets published. And maybe there will be the kind of reckoning that Hollywood has started to grapple with in the political sector. And you know, if that happens, eventually the hypocrisy will be so blatant, I hope, <laughs> that would contribute to perhaps the reevaluation of uh, the adequacy and the competence of our Dear President. Well, there, this is something that's troubled me in, in light of our, our President's stand and uh, Roy Moore and many of the things that have happened is, and no one seems to deal with this, is this a, an overall cultural problem that applies to all men in Western culture? And I won't even go to Eastern culture, but is it just a matter of becoming powerful enough to use that, uh, that power to abuse women sexually. I mean, is it is it lying dormant in every man? I because not. <laughs> in my experience, no. Okay. I, I mean, I, I, I have wonderful men in my life, and I, you know, including my father and partner, and I, you know, I, I wouldn't say that it's, it's a... So not every man's a predator just waiting for the opportunity. I don't believe so. <laughs> okay, because okay, that comes up sometimes. Uh, yeah, I mean, you tell me, do you think so? Um, I don't know. I have never had the power, and I know a lot of people that are nice guys, but I don't know people with that kind of power. Oh, I see the. Like I see what Weinstein. you're asking. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, absolute power corrupts absolutely, right? Right. That's a and I have been in situations in the workplace 
where people with a little bit of power, men, have tried to use it for dating or for harassing women, which was troubling, of course. Yeah. But I just wondered, that that sort of seems to be an emergent thing, especially considering Matt Damon uh, and his things, and Morgan Spurlock. And I mean, men like the senator from Minnesota. Franken, yeah. Frank, Al Franken do a lot of stupid fraternity <laughs> bullshit. Yeah. Uh, that, as Damon said, Matt Damon said, doesn't rise to the level of rape, but is is uncool, mm -hmm. is rude, and is disrespectful. Yeah. Do we put a spectrum together or put that all together? I don't know. I, I think a lot of smart people are thinking about that right now because that conversation is now open. Yeah, and I think that's important that it be dealt with more, especially in young boys. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and I have a, I have a feeling that there's a generation coming that's more understand woke to this issue. Yep. Right. Let's go back to film. Okay. Are we? Do you think we're going to start seeing a wave of women directed, uh, women written films hitting the festivals and hitting the Hollywood mainstream in the next? When? Yeah, I recently had the privilege of seeing um, Stacy Smith speak. She runs the Media Diversity and Social Change Initiative out of UFC, USC and Anaheim. And her entire um, think tank studies inequality in Hollywood. And she was fascinating to listen to. She has a great TED Talk that's out there online if your lis listeners want to look it up. Um, but you know, her, her data has shown that <clears throat> of the top 100 grossing films of every year, uh, less than a third of the characters that are speaking roles in these films are female. Of those, less than half are African American, and there's this, this minuscule representation when it comes to people with disability. So we're reflecting a world that doesn't exist with Hollywood, and we're reflecting what we value. And so what we can take from that is we're not, we don't see the stories that we value of women that we value. They're not there. Um, and because of this data, you know, that's the first step, right? Acknowledging the problem. Right. And, um, and Sundance has done quite a bit of gathering. And the Gina Davis Institute, yeah. yeah there's Annenberg a, School for Communications mm -hmm. has done work. And and the other thing that um, that that she's doing is coming up with solutions. So suggested solutions. A couple of them that struck me were one was called Just Add Five. And the whole premise is that if writers who are writing these top 100 grossing films of all time of all time of, of the year of each year would only add five speaking roles that are female to every script that they write, that inequality would diminish in the matter of four years. Another one she has is called the Equity Clause. And that is a legal document that um, A-list actors can use their leverage when they're contracting for films to require certain quotas before they'll sign on to any film. And those seem like very tangible solutions that people could put into play. And I, I want to point out to our listeners, we're talking about talent in front of the camera with this, but in the workforce behind the camera, it's ridiculous, only about 7% of 250 top gro grossing films were women involved in them. And I think that's the one thing that everyone that's agrees nothing. on. It's the one that, that the, the number one thing we can do to change the inequity in Hollywood is to put more women in director positions. Director as opposed to producer because it's the top creative role. Um, when you have women running films, you, they hire more women, they hire more people of color, um, they hire more women in pipeline positions and crew. So women that are coming up um, that could in the future be in positions of power. So that is, that is simply the answer, and it's probably the answer across the sectors. But speaking to film, that is why Film Fatales was created. Film Fatales was started several years ago in New York City by Leah Meyerhoff. Um, I joined, uh, I think within the first year when I lived in New York. Um, and it's a simple premise. You meet, the group meets uh, once a month at a rotating member's house to uh, support each other's projects and share resources and help get our films made. And it was so useful to me, that group, that when I moved to Salt Lake a year and a half ago, I looked for the chapter here, and there wasn't one yet. So I met with... And Utah's a pretty big place for films. It is. It has a Sundance fantastic community. Hollywood comes here to film. We have great locations and great crews. Yep. It's a great place for film. Um, and Virginia Pierce, the film commissioner, I met her early on to sort of ask what the... to find out about the community and... Um, we talked about the possibility of opening up a Salt Lake chapter of Film Fatales here. I also brainstormed with um, my partner, Tyler Meesom, who's a filmmaker here in Salt Lake, and with 
Geraldine Dreyfus, who was an executive producer on my film Vessel, and one of two people that I knew when I moved here. <laughs> and she, between the, between the three of the four of us, came up with a list of people that might be interested in being part of this, and we've been meeting ever since. Then we were just speaking about our nation seems to be going through a conservative phase, at least right where we're standing now. A lot of the things you've mentioned as solutions might smack as affirmative action to some of these people. I would think one of the problems is to keep quality up as you bring more women in. Is that possible to do? Yeah, I mean, I think that if you open up the applicant pool and make sure a fair consideration is given to people across you know, um, demographics, I mean, you're going to have qualified people for all of these roles. I don't think affirmative action prevents quality. And the other thing you were touching upon is there is a pervasive myth in Hollywood and in making money that 13-year-old boys drive the film market. Obviously, your film <laughs> wasn't aimed at 13-year-old no, boys. No, it certainly wasn't. <laughs> Although there's a lot of adventure in it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Are you seeing much change yet? In I mean, this is early. Things are just exploding. But are women getting it contacted more for... We had Wonder Woman, of course. That's a parallel yeah. event. I mean, I think I can speak more directly, less to statistics and more to community, which is, you know, what I'm most interested in. You know, you, the, the collective response to Weinstein, as evidenced in the Me Too movement, was so startling and so powerful um, and, you know, created a, a community between women that don't even know each other. And I think that is happening on the grounds here in Salt Lake. We've had, we, we see it happening, we've been meeting, we've had a couple, a couple gatherings of film fatales with other women, Utah women working in film, just to talk about this issue and figure out where we sit with it, you know, a, a place to vent and um, brainstorm and, and figure out how to support each other. Well, as this, as this rolls forward, and, and already Sundance has done quite a bit with getting more female talent involved in their festival. What will film festivals look like when there are more women directors, more women writers, presumably more women-oriented themes and storylines? Will it be a, sh a ground shift? I think that in terms of festivals, there's a lot of, there, we're bordering equity in festivals already. It's about what gets sold and what makes the money, and therefore the women who get the higher paying jobs, um, the top 100 grossing films, the, the way we measure how it, how it plays out monetarily in a lot of ways, because in a lot of ways that's power, that's about power, um, to then perpetuate stories by women. I mean, overall this sort of seismic shift that you're asking about, I, I would hope that that is what we'll see. We'll see a more accurate reflection of the world in terms of the stories that we value as a, as a whole society with so much difference. Well, one of the things, I just to drill down a little more, is television and film, major market film, blockbusters, even Wonder Woman, seem to revolve around violence and loud noises. Will that turn towards more social conflict and things like that? I don't know will, will if we I can see a comment on that. that. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> really sure if I, would, if I would draw that gender differentiation in terms of subject material that women like to direct because I'm, I think women have just as varied interests as men do. So I'm, I'm not sure if there'd be yeah. less action movies at the top than yeah. there are now. I was just curious yeah, because, curious because uh, uh, Jane Austen wrote extremely riveting books in which it's all social interaction taking place, yet it's it's unforgettable. Yeah. And then you have Die Hard 6 <laughs> you know, at the other end. Which I got to say I didn't see. <laughs> <laughs> well, one last question, and, uh, and I think this is an important one. Do you think that there's going to be a pendulum swing back against what's going on now? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people are talking about this inevitable backlash. It's hard to say. It's a, right now it has forward-moving momentum. We're seeing that. I think it's up to communities of women and also men you know, who are behind what the movement means to keep it moving forward, to keep what we were talking about before, this exploration of the nuance it, within it, um, so that it doesn't stagnate, it doesn't become a caricature of itself, and allow it to better our society. Well, thank you, Diana, for <laughs> being you. here. And this is Salt Lake Speaks, and listeners that want to hear other Salt Lake Magazine podcasts can hear them at saltlakemagazine.com backslash podcast. Our latest issue of the magazine has a, an in-depth discussion on the sexual abuse that uh, came out of Weinstein issue, 
And also, we discuss with uh, Geraldyn Dreyfus her new documentary that we don't know when it'll be out, but sometime in the next year, that will investigate this situation in Hollywood and in the uh, entertainment industry in general. Mm -hmm.